Now, Earl Warren, this guy, he's a real missionary sex kind of guy. He doesn't like skim milk and salt's like too spicy. First and... of all, don't don't discredit missionary sex. There's nothing wrong <laughs> no, with missionary only. sex. It's like that's all he does. Yeah. It's... You know what? Missionary sex is the, the creed <laughs> of of sex. It's like maybe not as bad as you think it is. everybody and welcome to 500 Open Tabs. I'm Kava Taharian and today we are doing another episode uh, with the absence of our friend Hannah Hillam who continues to be on her book tour for Cat People. Go check it out now. Go purchase the book if you can. Um, and as such, I'm not bringing one but two guest hosts this week to fill her very big shoes. And I'm very excited about having them both on because it's been uh, you know a while in the making. So first up is our returning champion. He is a GI doctor and host of the House of Pod, a humor-adjacent medical podcast. Please welcome back to the show, Dr. Kava Hoda. It's going to take two of us, two, two guests to fill one host spot. I think we can do it. I think together as a team, yeah. we can do it. But there's big shoes to fill. There's big shoes. Uh, thankfully, uh, in this corner, a challenger. He is a bassist, a songwriter, <laughs> a producer. Who has worked with such incredible talent as Bruce Springsteen, Sting, John Legend, Ringo Starr, Sia, and Bruno Mars. Uh, this is not a joke, by the way. Those are actual people that he's worked with. Uh, <laughs> and he's also had an array of other random jobs. Please welcome to the podcast the great, self-proclaimed, tallest human in the world, Kava Rastigar. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, so it is so great to be here. And speaking of big shoes to fill i am a size 15 so i will <laughs> i will i will just gladly take that rule this yeah, is yeah. um just this is going to be so confusing for the listeners as there yeah. are now three more caves on this podcast than has ever been on a podcast before on a podcast ever. exactly this is three yeah. times the cave this is insane how are we gonna deal with this how are the I listeners don't know. This, are we this is go just by the last? beginning. <laughs> it could multiply by the end of it, like gremlins. You don't even know. <laughs> More yeah, comedy disappear. Uh, exactly. Exactly. We. Um, this is this is the it's the Spider Man meme. Um, so just a little bit of context. I know that uh, Hoda. The last time you were on, we talked about how we first met, which was part of the, you know, during the pandemic, we were all trapped in our homes. We're all on Twitter a lot. I went on a rampage, adding a bunch of different kavas on Twitter one night because I just thought it'd be funny. <laughs> Uh, became friends with Hoda. Rossigars also was part of that initial batch. Um, and that's so you're actually a continuation of that lore. And then funny enough, uh, we were at so Sarah, my wife, Sarah and I, we went to um, one of the uh, Zan Zen Digi Ozadi, the woman life freedom, not protests, but demonstrations that were happening at, in Westwood over at the federal building. And we were walking towards, you know, where the crowd was. And there was this very tall guy walking behind us and i was like i think that's kava rastigar because you also like i said you had put on your twitter that you were the tallest person alive i think is what you'd said something to that effect, yeah it right? might have been the tallest person in the universe yeah in the universe <laughs> yeah. right yeah so it's like i think that's the same guy because that guy's yeah. pretty tall and i went and i was like hey what's up are you kava and you're like yeah and i was like hey i'm kava this is my wife sarah and you were like hey i'm kava this is also my wife sarah oh yeah. come it, on <laughs> yes yeah <I> know. <laughs> <laughs> oh that is my wife's name is actually Sarah too. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Her name is Kabe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it has to be one or the other. <laughs> like two names although, that exist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although, although my wife is in the same field as you, Hoda. Oh, she's um, a, so, she's, a, she's a yeah, GI. nice. She's a doctor. Yeah, she's a uh, uh, she's a uh, a foot and ankle surgeon, podiatrist. Oh, yeah. wow, that yeah. is rad. That is yeah. exciting. That's very useful, by the way. That's. Yeah, I might need to talk to her later. But but yeah, she's keeping it Persian. You know, she's she's uh, she's she's Iranian, and the the you know our joke is that you know you can be you can be whatever you want to be. You can be a um, an engineer or a doctor, whatever you want to be. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You guys really broke that mold. Look we at really you guys. Did. Yeah, look at you guys living <laughs> you. your best life, living the dream. You two, <laughs> you guys. I don't know how you guys escaped, but somehow you guys got out of it. Very nice. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's a good question. Yeah, KT, could... how did you? How did that happen? How did you? How did you escape the matrix of? I mean, I, I, <laughs> first of all, I'm I'm just so so proud of both of you. 
I just love that about Persian peoples that everybody's just like proud of each other. Yeah. But I really, I just really, I just have to say when I got, I think when you guys both reached out to me on Twitter, it was such a delightful shock. Um, but before we get into all of our tabs, we're going to go and uh, interview a little bit about Ross Sigar's, uh, relationship to tabs and to having a lot of stuff open. You know, what we always ask when we have a new guest on the show is, are you an open tab haver? Do you have a lot of them open? Do you have none of them open? Are you like a OCD person? Are you a crazy person? Where do you lie within that paradigm? Uh, very, um, I'm, I'm very much a, a crazy person and uh, not very yeah. OCD at all. <laughs> so this might, yeah, this, this probably, yeah, fits with my it just clearly fits with my genetic makeup, you know? So I, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, have plenty of tabs open. My wife will, uh, it's funny. Like she'll grab my phone and, um, I'll be like, you know, why is this running so slowly? She'll say here, here, let me see your phone. And then she'll just be swiping, <laughs> right? You know, like she'll just like be pushing them off the screen for like maybe a minute and a half. And then <laughs> finally it's like, here, here's your phone and it works. But, um, yeah, lots of, lots of tabs open. Actually, through this thing, when you know, when you were telling me about what what you do on the show, and I listened to some episodes, I I love what you guys talk about on the show. Thank you. Um, I love the concepts, and I just I looked through my tabs, and I was like, God, this is very predictable. This is very boring. Um, there's lots about you know just uh, uh, you know I don't know like volleyball practice uh, where wherever oh, you know wherever my my girls are playing volleyball, like just just random just. You know tabs like that. I just never close those. It's uh, yeah. But um, but there's yeah, there's quite a few that are. I'm looking at my my browser right now, and it's just uh, just a line of of maybe twenty things that are open. Yeah, not <laughs> so. bad. I imagine because you're a musician, there's a lot of tabs with tabs open, or are you not really. You know, you read actual music, don't you? You don't really read tabs as much as do you. Oh, tab like tablature? No, yeah. That, so yeah, that, that's what I thought you guys were talking about. I just worked on some Rush songs to play. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just worked out a uh, you know you know Tom Sawyer for you guys yeah. to to play on bass. I, I could I could listen to it for like two hours conservatively if you wanted to do that. Just like play really music for just, just bass practice. Yeah. It'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome, man. Well, we're really excited to have you on. And since you are our guest, I should say yeah. The first time guest, obviously Hoda, you're also a guest, but Hoda Hoda's like a little bit familiar with it, so um, we're gonna he put has the to go first. On. Yeah, yeah. Rastigar, you got to go first. So what's the uh, go what's first. the tab that you've been working on? By the way, I thought it was really funny when when uh, Rastigar and I were texting. I was like, "Hey man, it's kind of a short notice thing. We know that uh, you know Hoda and I host a show like usually once a week, so it's it's a grind." And I was like, "Just be ready for it if you know." And you're like, "No, I can do it." I'm gonna go as crazy as to say I could do it tonight if I had to. So I'm, <laughs> I'm interested to see. You came in real hot and confident, so I'm, I'm really curious to see if you're able to deliver. And I hope you can. That's, I know you can. Oh, that's that's a tough. Uh, that's a that's a tough. That's a tough yeah, way to, 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 to start to this there. up. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's it's like I'm I'm just trying to feign like Persian apex predator type a male confidence oh dude which i don't we got have. so much be- we got so much yeah. beta energy here bro yeah, you're exactly. okay you're like automatic <laughs> alpha okay we're... good size yeah. 15 dear lord size 15. Wow, yeah, exactly <laughs> um well um so here i go um so my tab is very much uh sadly pretty predictable uh the subject here uh general subject but it's uh it's music related and right. uh, it's for this is an article that I read. Um, it's entitled, and I'll send it to you, right? I'll send you this article and we yeah. can all listeners can follow along. The article says Talking Heads original lineup on Stop Making Sense, their early days and the future. Okay. Oh, I'm in. You know, now we can all just kind of think of all things Talking Heads. Um, basically, in, in reading this, I'm also reading um, Chris Franz kind of tell all. Uh, Chris is the drummer for the Talking Heads. Mm-hmm. He also started um, a band with his wife, also the bassist of the Talking Heads, Tina Weymouth. They started a band called Tom Tom Club uh, during the time oh, that Tom Tom Club, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that's like, I didn't Chris know and Tina. that. Yeah, I didn't realize. Yeah, that so and they they started in um, they started the Tom Tom Club while the Talking Heads was happening as well. You know, just like I guess the sub the subtext to this uh, to this tab analysis, I guess you mm-hmm. would say, is uh, it's. Reflecting on my obsession with the Talking Heads, um, it's All also right. regarding the realities of being in a band, 
how much it takes to put aside personal pride for the sake of a collective vision. Mm-hmm. And the simplicity, uh, these are all just little bullet points, the simplicity and steadiness to Chris Fran's drumming and the reality that every band is only as good as its drummer. Um, we can kind of touch on that whenever anybody, like, they'll they'll go off I, on Ringo, I would, maybe. I would love yeah, to I would love to touch on that right now. Well, yeah, how yeah. true that is, is you take a look at the Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah. Everyone thinks about, like, Billy mm-hmm. Corgan's, like, huge guitar sound. Nope. But, like, when they didn't have Jimmy Chamberlain, yeah, their drummer, Jimmy. doing all those fill-ins and all that, cr- bring some balance to it. It's just a wall of sound. With him right. there, it sounds like something beautiful. Without him there, when they got like the filter drummer to play on, like it just sounded to me like rubbish. It was like nothing. It was just like yeah. a lot of guitar sound without that melody and without that power. And Jimmy Chamberlain made that band like amazing. I think I, mm-hmm. I feel strongly that any other drummer, it would have been an okay, weird Chicago noise pop band. Like yeah, without sure. without him. For sure. And it's like, it's, it, you know, it's every band is down to its chemistry, you know, interpersonally, musically. And um, yeah, like, you know, yeah, Smashing Pumpkins without Jimmy is, is, it's a different thing. Or just like, imagine like Neil Peart playing drums for the Beatles. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's kind of fun, we, actually. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's yeah, like yeah. people, a drummer just, just so makes the sound of a band. And I guess when any, whenever anybody thinks about the band, the Talking Heads, I think, and this is just maybe my quick, you know, like a spit take would be David yeah. Byrne. Like people would think of David Byrne. Like he's yeah, he's the voice, he's the front man for the band, and um, he you know, wrote suits. wrote a wore crazy suits. <laughs> he wore crazy suits actually at um, you know, the uh, the the the, the film stop making sense. Uh, you guys might know, or uh, KT was shot at the Hollywood Pantages Theater. Did you know that? Oh no way, I didn't know that. Yeah, so you know you've been there, and that's where I've been um, there plenty of times. Yeah, and that's where uh, that's where they made that film. So yeah, so uh, kind of focusing on that, and uh, the re- yeah the reality that every band is good as drummer. Yeah, that, real quick that, though, did you do you started as did you start as a bassist originally, or did you start like how did you start new- getting into music? What was your first instrument? I got into music. I you know I grew up in a really music was just always playing in the house. Uh, when I was growing up, my my dad's got really, you know, my my parents both have really great taste in music, and mm-hmm. so there was just a, uh, my dad had a great record collection, and my so did my mom. They split up when I was really young. My mom was with a musician when I was growing up, and uh, he's a, he's a great guitar player, and uh, so I grew up around music. I grew up around a working musician. Got to see him you know, like write music, go to rehearsal, go do recording sessions and all that other stuff, play gigs. But yeah, like my dad's like a really like unconventional Persian dad in that he's, he's a chef, you know, that's his, his job. And, um, when I was a kid, I mean, he's a very, you know, Persians, a lot of them tend to be pretty artistic or like just love the arts. And, Mm -hmm. uh, so he's, you know, he kind of falls into that. And then I remember when I was a, when I was a kid, like when it was time to like pick up an instrument, he was like, you're going to be a jazz saxophone player, you know, which really? is like the most unversion thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. it was just like the, like the strangest kind of wish to, I mean, even now, like as somebody who I, you know, I made a living as a jazz bassist and, you know, it's like, I would never wish that on my daughters or my son, you know, just like you would become a jazz <laughs> saxophone player. <laughs> Even though it could be an amazing, incredibly beautiful and rewarding life, but it's like that's a that's all it's it difficult. could be a tough. It's road. a hard road. It's yeah. a hard road. musician is a is a tough fucking gig. I don't think people understand that, like how difficult sure. it is. How much practice you do on your own? How 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 many hours a day do you think you practice? Yeah. Even now, I, I mean, mean now I mean when I was when I was coming up, it would be you know I don't know. You, they always say like you know however many hours you need to put in, it would be daily. You would be working four to four to eight hours practicing practicing the the for me it's bass i started on saxophone by the way though i i started on oh, saxophone. you did so that was, was your first interesting yeah and then i just kept up with the sax and then when i was about 12 or 13 years old i picked up the bass and then and then that was like my own thing and that's kind of what i wish for like you know any young musician to have that kind of moment where they just really they identify with the the instrument 
you know, and they, they yeah. kind of find it and they get results on their own. You know, it's, it's yeah. not yeah. like through yeah. a teacher or anything. It's, it's more through their own thing. But, right. um, so, but rhythm is sort of what you were, you, you didn't want to be up there like finger tapping and, you know, playing yeah, crazy no. solos or lead singing. Well, I was curious cause you said, well, no, you know, but I, I mean, I, 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 drums. I did come up in the, uh, in the, the golden era of like kind of alternative, like punk alternative music. And so Flea and Les Claypool were just, just huge on the landscape. Yeah. So yeah. that is kind of like finger tapping and, and it's like, I guess it's, it's true. Yeah. That's unconventional bass playing. Like at a certain point where it's like to, to really make a living as a bass player, you have to learn to like not do any of that, you know, <laughs> like to just like <laughs> right, really right. like, you know, <laughs> right, right. But just hold down the yeah. fort. Yeah. Hold down the fort. Exactly. But, um, but yeah, there's still, you know, still a lot of practicing that you do and then moving into other worlds. Like, you know, it's just, you know, all the other kind of maintenance you have to do, you know, playing, playing the bass. Yeah. yeah. I just can't but, get over the fact that your dad, a Persian father was like, you're going to be a jazz saxophone player. That's probably the first time that's ever happened. Yeah. It's I'm going to come yeah, home from my job as a chef to tell you that you need to be yeah, a jazz right. sax exactly. player. I know. I mean, that's, and, and if you know him, I mean, that's just so him. He's, he's, he's like, uh, I mean, he's, he's such a great guy and so, um, loved in our family. And then, you know, just everybody else is like, they, they're just always shaking their head and smiling at, at just kind of, you know, that, that of course he would say something like that. That yeah, is, that is so who cool. He is. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So the, um, that the, one of the things that really struck me with Chris Franz is, um, you know, I was a fan of this band since I was a little kid. My parents got the uh, the album Stop Making Sense in 1983. That was like their big, like one of their big commercial, like their big commercial hit. There was a song Burning Down the House on that record. And I remember staring at the liner notes when I was a kid and like memorizing the lyrics from the liner notes and finally getting to see the movie Stop Making Sense and getting to see how you know, they just looked on stage and it's just such a beautiful stage show. It's so incredible. And particularly like watching the drummer get on stage and leave the stage. He's like, they're known as like this kind of like nouveau, like kind of preppy band in a time that came up in the, like the, the, the lower East side Bowery scene of like the same scene as the Ramones and as television and, uh, Patty Smith and, Mm-hmm. But they kind of dressed in like he would wear the you know the drummer would wear like clothes from Brooks Brothers or like Izod t shirt you know Izod shirts and they just kind of kept that kind Fancy. of like yeah pseudo like preppy everyman look but just the vision of Chris Franz jumping on stage and like full like fists in the air like just so psyched to be there like kind of like embodying um, just enthusiasm and he's just you could just tell how psyched he is he has this like, grin on his face the whole time. That always stuck with me. Yeah. And his drumming is so like, it's like a workhorse. There's not a lot of frills with the way he plays drums. And it's just like steady as she goes, but very steady, beautifully like solid. And so, I heard his, I heard his wife me. say once, sorry to interrupt. I, I heard his wife say once that they would love to mix up the instruments. Like they would, everyone would like to play everyone else's instrument, change mm-hmm. things up and they would try to play different instruments. But she said, that they could never make a song work if he wasn't on the drums. Everyone else could switch. Mm. Everyone else in that band could play a different thing. Someone right. could play the bass. Someone could play an organ if they didn't. But if he wasn't on the drums, the song just wouldn't start. They wouldn't even be able to do it. So he was like, yeah. he really was sort of in- integral into that 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 For band. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Like he's he's kind of like the the engine of it. I could see that too. And that's the thing too with him. Um, it's. Uh, you know, he's got that kind of energy. It's pretty clear how psyched he was. And um, the other thing that's remarkable, like you're kind of getting at, is like his relationship with his wife, with Tina Weymouth. And the, you, their love for each other is pretty clear through any interview with him and um, and uh, his book. And then, you know, just spotlighting her incredibly unique uh, bass playing. She's just she's just such an uh, a beautiful bass player. Like, she isn't like grounded in like like any sort of like blues like rock cliches nothing it's all just kind of like they're just such inventive bass lines and as as a musician as a bass player growing up listening to them at an early age i just kind of expected that that's how you played bass but then like the Mm -hmm. further and further you get away from it you just listen to that band and it's like it's just so unique sounding so anyhow um i went in deeper into this i don't know how deep we should go 
Um, That's what we do on the show. We just go into whatever tangents you like, as long as you uh, get to get it off your chest. Okay. Um, Yeah. So uh, we could just kind of start from the beginning with him. You could just interrupt me anytime and we could just change the subject. But don't um, worry, we will. Okay, good. (laughs) Good. All right. That's um, what we do. (laughs) So for all of you who wanted to know about Chris Brands, I'll just I'll give you a little bit here. Um, He was born in 1951. Um, and he came from kind of like a well-to-do family. That was interesting to me. And uh, he was born in Lexington, Kentucky. His father was an army officer. Um, he went to West Point. His mom and dad were like uh, college sweethearts. She was like considered like a Southern belle. And his father later, like when once he and his brother and sister were born, he went to Harvard um, st- to study law. And uh, they, they moved around a bit. And then they settled in Pittsburgh. And that's where, you know, he kind of grew up and... Um, developed this love for love for music and uh and he really got into um like starting his own band uh through you know the way that kind of everybody else or a lot of other american musicians did um hearing the beatles on the ed sullivan show 1964 that's when like you know bruce springsteen's talks about like or little steven talks about hearing that and uh everybody just started a band the day after that you know i guess that aired on a sunday and on a monday there were like thousands of bands all over the country it seemed like he kind of lived like an idyllic life you know um and you could say privileged life and what i thought was kind of cool is like uh reflecting on his upbringing he's kind of like refreshingly unapologetic about it is he's not like you know like i grew up in the the rough streets of whatever he's just like i had every opportunity (laughs) he's not hiding it he's just like it was really cool i got to do all this crazy stuff and yeah, I, he's not I don't kid know. rocking it, pretending that like he <laughs> no, you know, exactly. Was kid rock rich? <laughs> yeah, apparently. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah dude. He's he, cosplaying should... as a poor person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's cause he's cosplaying as an everyman when you know he you know he he wasn't he wasn't an yeah. everyman. Started playing bands with friends growing up. He really clicked with an art teacher in high school who persuaded him to go to art school, and so he uh, was persuaded into going to the Rhode Island School of Design in uh, RISD RISD and that was yeah and that was in the late 60s Um, he described meeting all the kind of like the freaks and all the different kinds of artists that he was around uh, drawing nude models and drawing class and studying different kinds of art he also talks a lot about the burgeoning music scene in Providence Rhode Island at the time Uh, he joined a band at school playing drums in uh, in college they played some dances and functions at school, and then he meets Tina Weymouth uh, at RISD. Describes being in love with her from the beginning. They were friends for about a year be- before they became involved romantically. And um, right around this time, he meets David Byrne, who was also a-, a student that was, I guess he had dropped out of RISD, but he was still living in Providence. And he meets David Byrne. They start a band together. Uh, they were called the Artistics. And uh <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, surprisingly uncreative name. Yeah, he's yeah. really on yeah, the head exactly. there. They just went for it, and uh, they played a lot of covers, and they played some Al Green songs and uh, Smokey nice. Robinson songs. But they also wrote some original music, and one of the uh, one of the songs that uh, they wrote, like right off the bat, was a song called "Psycho Killer." That um, I guess David Byrne kind of had this premise for, like you know, this person just dis- disaffected from humanity that from his perspective. And I guess Tina, who didn't play in the band at the time, was just close friends with them. Uh, she wrote the bridge of that song. She wrote it in yeah. French. Chris said, uh, I suggested that since Tina spoke French, why not have her write the bridge in French? And she put down what she was doing and got right to work at it. And uh, she thought that um, she thought that in that song, they should look to Alfred Hitchcock, who's Norman Bates character, took offense to women when he saw that he saw as being loose. And uh, the words that she contributed were, ce que je fais ce soir-là, ce qu'elle a dit ce soir-là, réalisant mon espoir, je me lance uh, vers ma à la gloire. I can't even, I can't even say what she said. What she am I basically said, what am I, yeah, what I did a it? cover of this. My band did a cover of this and I can't remember the <laughs> I oh right! Yeah, Hold it's like, you, you play too, right? I forgot. You're, yeah, you, yeah. You well, also I mean, play not, bass? Not no, I play guitar, but no, I'm guitar, not, okay. not like Ross. You guys, here, but... you guys played this song. We did a cover of it. I'm trying to remember the goddamn. I, I remember. The, I remember looking it up. It doesn't make sense, but it kind of does. The it's such a cool mind. thing to have. Yeah. yeah, like in in the song, such a great little touch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's. I mean, 
there, there's so much about their music where it's just uh yeah listening listening to the lyrics um there's another song that that um chris franz wrote the lyrics for which i always kind of assumed that david byrne wrote all of the lyrics yeah um and uh but he wrote that song i don't know if you know their first album is called 77 and there's a song called warning signs and then it's uh chris wrote the lyrics for that song yeah. and uh and i think early on that kind of became a, a, a thing with them where uh burn kind of in some ways would take credit for some of that stuff and there would be i think there would be that relation that push and pull relationship where you know he contributed he obviously contributed so much to the band but i think there was some bitterness that would kind of just start to grow out of that kind of mm-hmm. stuff where and you know one of those things was uh they had a gallery show in providence where um there was a, an, it was an early show of theirs where they were going to be performing at a um uh, an art show with like a collective art show with uh you know with with some of their friends they showing some of their pieces their paintings and apparently um Dave you know according to Chris Franz uh Byrne had shown up to that gallery like maybe the night before and rearranged all the art so it appeared to be his show his own solo show yeah. which which is crazy you know like it's or it's yeah. you know kind of a crazy way to to kind of look at that stuff and he said I mean, he said years later, he treated the rest of us in Talking Heads with similar disrespect and continues to do so. I have to wonder how his new collaborators will feel. Tina has said that he seems incapable of returning friendship. And we learned this from experience. I'm not I'm not surprised, to be yeah. honest with you. I mean, first of all, I'm actually a fan. The I've listened to them. I love their music. Um, yeah. I, in fact, it was the first like cassette tape I ever bought that wasn't like Weird Al Yankovic or some garbage <laughs> top 40 music. You know what I mean? Hey, it was right. not first, garbage, right? Weird, Weird Al. Al. Yankovic, Weird, Al yeah. Weird Al's great, but I mean like it was the first time I understood that music could be more was the right. Talking Heads. I was like, oh my god, yeah. music can be this amazing, huge, beautiful thing. So even that being said that I've known them, I didn't know Chris Franz's name until right now. <laughs> Right, and, right, and I, I certainly had no idea. Curse of the drummer. Right, I had no idea anyone else's name other than David, and like the fact that like he wrote some lyrics is totally news to me. That's, and if I'm someone who actually knows the band, I, I mean, I could see why there would be frustration. Whether or not David meant to do that or not, I don't know. But like, clearly, I would be frustrated if I was in that band. Yeah. Which I mean, that's the thing too. It's like when you're when you're in bands. Um, that kind of stuff happens a lot. I mean, there's a lot of push and pull and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of personalities and a lot of personality, like some personalities that have to be muted for the sake of the whole, you know, yeah, it can be really frustrating. It can really like, it can really build up, it can really grow. It can just turn into some like brutal kind of resentment, which, right. you know, I don't know that, I mean, obviously like I'm just, I'm a fan and like, I, I love, everything that you know each of these musicians have done and i'm not trying to like spread gossip about them but i can yeah. kind of see how this kind of thing would happen too you know just based on uh, on their personalities but um yeah that's that's just it's always a, a crazy dynamic i mean like so like just kind of cutting to the kind of end of like all this stuff here with mm-hmm. with the with the um the chris story like it really reminded me of this this book i read years ago and it's by this guy robertson davies it's a book called The Fifth Business. It was a book about like the fifth business. It refers to uh, it was like a term in like like British drama and um, or like British uh, yeah drama I guess theater. The definition of the fifth business is it, it refers to the roles in a play, uh, which being neither those of the hero nor the heroine, conf- confidant or villain, but which were nonetheless essential to bring about the recognition or the denouement. That was called the fifth business in drama and opera companies organized according to that old style. The player who acted these parts was often referred to as the fifth business. And the, you know, that book's all about this guy who was like a, um, I think he was like a school, <clears throat> he was a school teacher who was at a high school, which that's symbolic, right? Like you're watching like people year after year, like go off and achieve, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're like, you're kind of like pushing them off to achieve and year after year, and then year after year, none of them come back to see you. And like, you're just kind of always viewed as that one part of the stepping stone towards their success. And this high school teacher, I think he like, it's been a long time since I read it, but I think he, he retires 
and he, he's like his career is just like written down it's like it's just kind of reduced to this like footnote you know, in someone else's yeah. story it's reduced he's to a taught footnote. high school for 30 years that's exactly it. but then the the whole point of, of of it is just kind of illuminating like how much this guy or like what an integral role he had in in other parts of the story but that's just something i've always thought about and really refer you know like you know reflects back to to a lot of you know a lot of musicians or a lot of artists who work in a collaborative way it's like so many people are essential to like all this like you know amazing art like films and yeah. and you know pieces of music and all that other stuff oh man you have such a unique perspective on it it's interesting because like i know I, I mean, you're an amazing artist, and uh, I mean, I've heard your stuff. It's really great. You're obviously very talented great. at what you do for your profession here. Go stream Kava Rastigar on Spotify right now. <laughs> yeah. Take yeah. a break. Thanks. We'll be Thanks. right here. Yeah, right now. <laughs> we'll be right back. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but you're also, I, I know you're a fan. You listen to music. You enjoy other people's music. We're, uh, you know, we're pretty much. If you do, you have a little bit more left on the tab. You think, or uh, you know, I, I got I end, got more or... stuff, but I just I just recommend uh, I recommend uh, listening to this, listening to their music. I guess something on the other side of of the um, Chris, like all the Chris anecdotes. I mean, you know, like they basically they ended up moving to New York. They started this band. They officially started this band. Tina joins the band. It's the most incredible group. They get Jerry Harrison, who's from the Modern Lovers. And they just go on to like make just really incredible album, album to album that are all just, all just so worth listening to. Just a side note that I want to finish on is an yeah. anecdote from a buddy of mine. He's a great producer, Justin Stanley. I was talking to him this morning and I was mentioning that I was doing this and he was like, oh, I got to tell you this, you know, this great David Byrne story. And it was, it was, uh, Justin's, um, Justin's wife is, uh, the artist Nika Costa and, um, they've, right. you know, they've, he was telling a story about how she had a show at the House of Blues in L.A. Um, years ago, and David Byrne came to the show. And uh, he sure. said it always stuck with me that David Byrne came, you know, took time out of his day, he came to Nika's show, and he seemed to be having a great time, seemed to be really into it. And Justin talked to him after the show, and he said, I really love that you're out here. Uh, you know, like It means the world that you took time to come out to the show, and I love that you're out here. And And, and what David said to him that really stuck with him was, he said, I make a concerted effort every week to make a live performance and to be engaged with the arts. So I thought that mm. was a really cool. Yeah. Nice. You yeah. know, that is great. Always stuck with it. That's yeah. a great reminder for everyone, even people right? who aren't artists, they need yeah. to do that. I absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So, well, that's really I'm, cool. Uh, that's yeah, a well, nice little other perspective of the talking heads. A band exactly. That, like, Just like you thought you always yeah. needed. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know I needed, and then yeah. and really I <laughs> yeah. did need. Yeah, exactly. I did need. <laughs> yeah, awesome, man. Well, thank you, Ross DeGraff. It was fantastic. It was my pleasure. You made it. You made it through. You did it, and you didn't have to do it the same night that we uh, proposed. So I'm glad you got exactly. a little bit more time to marinate on it. Yeah, and and had I had I known how much time it would take, I I would have been eating my words. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could edit that out. Yeah. Uh, no, no, we fully, Hannah and I always talk no. about it. We're always like, you think you're like, eh, I could put together a story about something that I love talking about. And you realize you're like, nope, it's so much more work than you think. It's just like putting together a book report. It yeah. is. It did feel book reporty. Yeah. You did great. Uh, hey. You did great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. Anyway, uh, what's your tab, buddy? What do you got for us? Okay. So I sent you guys some pictures. Yes. Go ahead. You were really excited. Them. You well, were trying to show us all this stuff, and I was like, wait till we start actually recording. I want to make sure it's not a, so it's a while, be a surprise. A while back, uh, I was on Twitter, and there was like this, uh, there, I forget what it was, creepy.org, some <sighs> terrible, some terrible like history uh, site had a picture of an old timey, like Victorian era oh. <laughs> um, surgeon. Uh, I'll let you guys actually, uh, Kave T, can you describe, yeah. describe to the listeners what the first picture is? Um, Let's see. The order it came in, there's a, it just it looks like a guy performing surgery, but it's funny because the way he's holding the knife, it looks like someone, like there's a group of people. I know that they're there to watch the surgery, but because my brain is weird, I look at it as all these people who are at in the surgery room are trying to take the body away from this surgeon and he's threatening to stab them with his knife, <laughs> which I know that that's not the story there, but that's what I'm thinking. It's this no. guy, he's bald with giant mutton chops. So there's this tall surgeon standing over a patient. 
He's holding a knife and he's looking to the people around him watching the surgery, saying something, like kind of teaching them, showing them. He's like a showman. You can kind of this. I think I've seen this painting. You might have, and you might have seen the headline associated with it. Let me, before I get to that, let me just ask you guys, you're not um, licensed physicians, I know. But what no. do you I, think? I mean, not anymore. I used to be, but, you know, not I in decided this to take a break. Yeah, I um, thought podcasting would be more lucrative. And uh... <laughs> you, yeah, well, you never know. Um, yeah. You never know. So what do you guys imagine is the worst possible outcome you could have uh, with a surgery? Um, being sued as the surgeon. That's a bad one. Just, yeah, that's a bad one. Just... But what, what's, um, what's even worse than that? This, this, you're saying as in, a doctor, you're saying. At, in general. We're talking infection, like, infections. Right. Infections. Yeah. Sepsis. Sepsis. Yeah. What happens if those things happen? It puts the patient at risk for death. Yeah. yeah. So a patient dying is the worst thing you can imagine. Not good. Not you great. might have seen this picture associated with the headline, the surgery that killed three people. Oh, ah, okay. Or 300% mortality rate. I got interested in this. I had to get into it. The basic story is about this surgeon named Robert Liston. He is a big figure in the world Robert of surgery. Liston. Robert Liston. He's famous for this surgery now. Now he's famous for this. We'll talk about things he's famous for <laughs> outside of that. But during the surgery, it somehow killed three people. The patient, his assistant, and a spectator. Oh, Wow. Well, you're not talking three different surgeries. You're talking no, about in this one, one specific surgery, sit down. Kill, it's yeah. Three. <laughs> he had a hat trick. Hat yeah. trick, which has yeah. never been done to my knowledge before or since. This guy's a uh-huh. legend. We're gonna get we're gonna get a little more into it. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I have some thoughts about the veracity of this tale, and we'll mm. we'll get into a little bit of it. But first, let's talk about Robert Liston Bob. Um, I don't think he went by Bob. I'm just calling him that. Bob was, Liston. <laughs> Bob Liston. Professor of Clinical Surgery at the University College uh, Hospital in London. He's kind of famous not just for this. He's also the first person in Europe to use anesthesia. That came later in his career. He was born in Scotland in 1794. His mom died when he was six. He was raised by his father, who was a minister. He went to the University of Edinburgh. I don't know if it's Edinburgh or Edinburgh. 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 Edinburgh at 14 years old. Two oh, years wow. later, two years later, he went to medical school. <laughs> um, fast and track. he trained. Yeah, fast yeah. track. I, is I, to that be when honest, he did this triple surgery? Is he was six no, years old? No. To be honest, with you, back then, I, I don't know how tight the regulations and rules on becoming yeah. a doctor were. I feel like it didn't take much in yeah. the past to be a doctor. But how many years of residency did he do? Yeah, that's a <laughs> yeah. great yes, question. Yes, I, yeah. So he he trained under a guy named Doctor John Barclay, a famous anatomist. Um, he was a, known to be talented. Very early on, people recognized that he was actually quite good at mm-hmm. this. But he had a lot of disagreements with Barclay. That's kind of a running theme in this guy's life. He ended up opening his own anatomy class where he'd bring people to learn from him. He was known for being a fearless surgeon. He would operate on patients that other people would just send away. It does not seem like, from what I've read, that he suffered fools kindly. He didn't seem to be necessarily a very popular amongst his colleagues it's not clear to me if there was a competition if he was stealing patients from them if he was just kind of a jerk it seems like a little bit of all of those things in uh 1818 he became a surgeon at the royal infirmary of edinburgh and he was a member of the royal college of surgeons uh, of england um, and he had a pretty rocky relationship with them they actually took his uh they banned him for a couple years because maybe he was taking more patients and doing more surgeries than they wanted him to do. It's not clear to me. Uh, Eventually, the ban was revoked, and he was appointed to a senior surgical post. Let's talk about his surgeries, because I think that's where it gets really interesting. Can I I interrupt real quick and interject? So we talked about, I was a guest on your podcast. Yeah. uh, And uh, you mentioned this a little bit. So for people who are listening to this podcast who didn't know, can you explain to the audience, because you you talked about this in terms of like sort of what the stereotypes were of like, let's say, surgeons versus you know, psychiatrists or whatever. So surgeons tend to be a little bit more like jocks, I think is if I remember correctly, is what you talked about. Just, just general so, stereotype. So if I can, if I, I can't really attest to how it was back in the day, but yeah. in modern parlance, the surgeons kind of consider themselves the alpha dogs. 
mm-hmm. of the hospital. They tend to be like, especially because I'm kind of like a large doctor. Um, <laughs> people always assumed I was going to go into orthopedics. And I was like, no. Do you not. also have a size 15 foot or what? What's uh, the deal? 14. 14 oh, and a half. I defer to Kaveh Rostegar here. Goodness. As the champion. Sitting here stuff. with an That's 11 great. and a half, like a beta, like I yeah. am. Jeez. But uh, no, I'm a large mammal um, for those yeah. who don't know me. Uh, I'm a large mammal as well. And I, uh, in the hospital, I'm quite large. So everyone's like, oh, you got to be an orthopedic surgeon. I'm like, no, no, I'm not. And then they find I'm Persian. They're like, oh, you're going to be plastics. I'm like, no, no, not that either. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Uh, so, yeah. but but that's kind of how it is now. It's like kind of like it, it's become better over time and a little bit more diverse. But yeah, for a long time, it's just like a bunch of old white dudes. Um, as surgeons, like tall white dudes who sort of like consider themselves the the, the jocks of the hospital. Mm-hmm. Internal medicine, which is what my background is, I specialized yeah. in GI after that. That's kind of the more nerdy, cerebral sort of mm-hmm. guys. Um, so I don't know if it was the same thing there, but he is, he was, by the way, I'll, I'll cut to it right now because we're talking about it. He was actually six foot two, yeah. which at the time was like, eight inches taller than like the typical Englishman and maybe like three feet taller than the average Englishman. Now I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. He was a big guy. He, he, he's had this big legacy in surgery. He's done a lot of things that have sort of changed the way surgery is. Um, he wrote a, um, a couple books, including something called practical surgery in 1837. And in that he argued for the importance of quick surgeries. And that's going to be a, a big theme of his surgeries and how this story about him comes to be. He said, these operations must be done about with determination and completed rapidly. He even admits that this creates some hazards, but you're, you have to remember at the time there wasn't a lot of good options. You couldn't do a surgery for a long time because we didn't have blood transfusions. They didn't even have anesthesia. It was terrible. You had to get these things done and and dusted as soon as you could. And, right. and you're going to hear some stuff in this that's going to make him seem like a monster. But he actually, in some ways, was oddly ahead of his time. So okay. keep this in mind when you hear all the stories about him, both here and if you read up on him later. He actually was the first person I ever saw that emphasized the importance of actually studying and being intense about being a surgeon. How you had to do this and dedicate your whole life to it. You had to do anatomy all the time. You had to know exactly where you were. You had to know exactly what you were dealing with. Mm. He really took it to that next level. And yeah, he's like, you can't, this can't be a side hustle. You can't be a right. weekend warrior. You really, you got to be like Rustiger here. Six nights a week. Six nights a week. Doing surgeries on the road. Yeah. <laughs> as often <laughs> as possible. Hours cutting up end. as many different yeah. people as you can. Yeah, yeah. So you get it down pat. Sure same thing. thing. Yeah. Same thing. Rostigar's mortality rate is probably a little bit better, but <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know what yeah, kind yeah. of shows he's playing down there. Yeah. Um, he was also, I think, a little bit more ahead of his time in terms of the patient-surgeon relationship. In one of his books, he also wrote, it is of the utmost importance to attend to the state of the patient's mind and feelings. He ought not to be kept in suspense, but encouraged and assumed and his assured, I'm sorry, and his apprehensions must be uh, delayed. So he was actively trying to say, hey, you got to treat your patients like humans. They're not just like cadavers for you to work on. So I think he's, that was also he's pretty compassionate. Heavy. Compassionate. Yeah. yeah. I mean, of course, he then goes on to describe in his book Amputation of the Hip Joint in some of the most barbaric manners you can imagine. But so much of medicine is like that. So much of medicine is like what we do now that we think is so cutting edge and awesome. 20 yeah. years from now, we're going to look back on it and be like, oh, we were fucking Ugh. monsters, right. you know? So was this was this somebody that you had heard of before? Like, it seems like he was, he was published. I had not. You... No, okay. I, but I'm not a surgeon, so I don't know. Maybe surgeons know. I'm a, I'm a smart doctor, so I didn't go into <laughs> surgery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take that, surgeon. Suck Shots it. Shots fired. Uh, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I think maybe in surgery, he's more of a, a figure that they've heard about. Okay. I've heard lots of doctors since I've learned about this, speaking about him and writing about him. The truth is, though, I don't know how how many people who have discussed him have really looked into his backstory. Because nowadays, when they discuss him, it usually comes in one of two things. People are talking about that anesthesia case that he did, mm-hmm. the first one in Europe, or more likely this 
case with the three people who died. So okay. you just kill three people one time and then people yeah. follow you for the rest of your life. <laughs> God this damn it. Well so said. I don't know if people understand like all the rest of the stuff behind him. And, you know, he was an interesting guy. He was like a showman. Like you could see it in that picture. He would say things like his catch. Yeah. Catchphrase before he began. <laughs> He'd be like, I don't know if I want to get surgery from a know, doctor who's got a catchphrase. Catch <laughs> yeah. He's like Dr. Daddy. Nick from the Simpsons right. or something. Right. Wow, wow, wee, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he would say, time me, gentlemen, ch- time me. And then he would get started. And oh, he, wow. he was known as the fastest knife in the West End. Oh. But that is but that is a big thing with surgery, though. It's like it's to the time, like, right? Because you're cut, you're um you're cutting off blood to the, to the limbs and you want to, you want to be able to make sure that they can use that, that limb and it doesn't, doesn't die. Right. Like the nerves are dying. You're exactly right. Even now there is a good balance that has to be met between the time it takes to do something and avoiding complications because of that and going too fast where you mess up. But, but yeah, that, that was especially back then. Cause again, there was no anesthesia, no transfusion, just the shock alone of having your and amputations, by the way, were very common. They didn't have a lot of other options. Like, yeah, you broke something badly or wow. you, you, you got cut. They'd take that fucker off because they didn't want to risk infections if they could or right. because they didn't have a lot yeah. of better treatment options. So you had <laughs> totally to totally realize that chopping off heads was actually probably a bad idea. In the survival yeah. Rate of that it, the amputations too, of the head are not, not great. great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But he was getting he would get he would amputate legs in about two and a half minutes. Wow. Does wow. that seem insane? Like yeah. you don't have to be a doctor to realize that's fucking nuts. Like it's in the time it fast. takes to download an app on your phone, like he is you know, but by the time it takes for you to make a cup of coffee in the morning, he had a leg off the table. So Yeah. Sharp knife. Very yeah. sharp. Sure. He invented his own knives too, yeah. You know, also See, that, those I would buy. I would buy the guy if like that's a good catchphrase. Like if he's on, <laughs> he's on late night TV, yeah, right. QVC, being like, I can cut off a leg in two minutes with one of these knives. I'm in. Imagine right. what Buying you can do shit. to your pot roast. Yeah, yes. exactly, <laughs> exactly. I should also say during this time, the link between infection and uh, hygiene, iatrogenic infection, which means an infection given to you by a doctor or the healthcare system, iatrogenic. That that is, that wasn't really clear to people. People didn't really understand that. There were maybe like at the time one or two doctors who were like, "Hey, there is this like connection I think between hygiene and reducing infections." And people like Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes would say, "Hey, we should wash our hands and all this stuff," and people would get pissed off. People would get so angry about it. Like in those days, the surgeons would actually wear butcher frocks, right? And they would barely wash them. Right. right. They would, because because that was actually seen as like a sign of like being a good surgeon. If there was like right, right, right. blood and gristle and guts it's and like, stuff on it's it. It's like being a painter. Yeah. If you don't have paint all over your clothes, people are like, how do I know that you yeah. even did any work? That's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. They relished this. In fact, at the time, Sir Frederick Treves, who wrote about this, said, there was no object in being clean. Indeed, cleanliness was out of place. It's considered to be finicking and affected. I don't entirely understand the parlance of that time, but it sounds like he's calling surgeon's masculinity into question with yeah. that. Someone else, I forget who wrote it, said an executioner might as well man uh, do a manicure on his nails before chopping off a head. Okay. <laughs> Which, by the way, I think is the least an executioner can do. I feel yeah, like yeah. Imagine getting a hangnail a, when you got to chop someone's head off. That sounds yeah, really it's, painful. It, it's also appearance wise. It's like it's an important day for everyone involved. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, gotta yeah, look your man. best. Where where are we in? Was it was it Joseph Lister? Was that the one that comes oh, up with the whole look at you. The thing? I mean, yeah. I'm just throwing out. I just anytime I can, I'm gonna let you guys know what I think, purport to know. But but when was that in 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 context with with Lister? Uh, Lister comes shortly after, um, and he actually, I believe it was the same institution. Um, I have to double check that. Scott as well. Uh, he was British. I don't know like what his okay. like background there. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. It, it was he was around in the same time, and he was one of the guys, the key people to that talked about preventing infection and wounds during surgery as well. Right. Um, 
and I, I don't want to say for sure because I don't know. Maybe this is a different episode, but like, yeah, yeah. he yeah. is. He was around. He came a little bit later. I, I feel like, and he was okay. one of the first okay. people that really pushed that concept forward. So okay. he was. Yeah, you're exactly right. It, and then my guess is it was in the same hospital setting. Okay. So uh, we weren't there yet, though, and it was still pretty rough. Robert, our guy, would yeah. get his hands like, deep in, no gloves, yeah. obviously, Yeah. deep in. He would, like, hold the knife in his mouth while he was just yeah. like, tearing stuff with his hands. And, right. And, you know, uh, pretty gnarly. he got a manicure, so that's probably all right. Because he cared. Um, I will say he was one of the few people at the time who actually washed his hands before surgery. Like, he, he had some sense of it. Like, well, I don't know if he knew about germ theory or anything like that, but he was like, uh, he at least did something before him. Later, like in 1847, this surgeon in Vienna named Ignaz uh, Philip Simmelweis, he's really the one who showed, he, he showed that if you washed hands and kept clean, mortality rates of surgeries would drop dramatically. Okay. And, and for that, he had his career ruined completely and he died broke yeah. and insane. Oh, no. And like, yeah, insane asylum. Yeah. No shit. Ter- really. Terrible, terrible story about that. Yeah. It just goes to prove you should never be, you know, uh, groundbreaking. I-, I also like that he had to prove it by being like, here are two patients where I don't wash my hands and those <laughs> patients died. And he's like, that didn't work. Well, yeah, he, sh- he showed it in his hospital. He's like, we implemented these wa- hand washing techniques and our mortality rate is like, this and mm-hmm. the next door hospital that doesn't is oh, this okay. much higher since they didn't do it. So he he did show it, uh, but nobody cared. Um, people Ugh. were really people had weird thoughts back then about healing. Like for actually, we'll talk about this with the As anesthesia opposed to now, where it's much more logical, <laughs> right. and, uh Based in science, a, a, yeah, well, at least five percent more. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but that that is something that would happen. Is like for anesthesia, for example. People didn't want anesthesia at the time because they thought that the intense pain of one of these surgeries actually helped the healing process. Was with yeah. healing. Yeah, it corresponded yeah, yeah. with healing. Uh, Which is like Bill Gates can control you if you get anesthesia in <laughs> right. 5G. Like, what are you going to do? Plant the chip. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, all right, so getting back to our boy Rob, he would carry around these scalpels. He had them all the time. He had them up his sleeve in his coats to keep them warm. He made little notches in them. He he was a really fascinating guy. He, as I said, was the first person to try this to try anesthesia for at the time, which was, you know, people looked down upon. I found a letter that he wrote to the Lancet, which is like probably the one of the two biggest uh, British medical journals. He wrote this in December of 1846 after he did the first surgery there. My dear sir. I tried the ether inhalation today in a case of amputation of the thigh and in another requiring avulsion of both sides of the great toenail, one of the most painful operations and surgeries, and with the most perfect and satisfactory results. So he was kind of ahead of his time. He referred to it as the Yankee Dodge. I looked it up. Dodge, I think, means like like medicine or something. A Yankee because it was first made in Massachusetts, the anesthesia. At the time, other people were using hypnosis. That's the best they would do. Is oh, they try wow. to mesmerize somebody. Mesmer yeah. would like would try to like get them like sleepy uh, before they would do the surgery. And he was he was one of the first people to start pushing against that. So it, he he also developed some new techniques in terms of like making a flap over the bone when he cut off a leg. He invented instruments, some locking forceps, which are actually still used today. So. He really contributed quite a bit. But part of the reason I think he's not a bigger figure, a more well-known figure in surgery is because people just did not like him. He was Mm. argumentative. He was abrasive. He could be abrupt. He would say what he's really thinking. He didn't, uh, if he thought something was being done that was unethical, he would very loudly and clearly state it in front of other people. He was probably pretty rough on his trainees, as far yeah. as I can gather. This guy, this guy's not playing rhythm in a band with Rostegard. He's he is not subtly guiding people towards a conclusion. No, no. And then he no. was also the probably un- unpopular with his wife, yelling his catchphrase "time me" yeah. every, every night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Time me, because there's a time room me. of gentlemen watching. Time yes, me, yeah. gentlemen. Time, time me. me. <laughs> Thirty seconds. Yeah, all right. Seriously, we can't all be Sting. Okay, Rostegard. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Can't all be tantric safe. surgery. Not, not tantric surgery. 
Cool. Nothing it wasn't yet a thing. A, <laughs> nothing wrong with two and a half minutes, guys. That's respectable time. Okay, yeah, that's respectable. I'm just putting it out great. there. Okay, yeah. I, don't, I don't need your judgment. I feel it. Yeah. But but it, through all this, like his sort of difficult nature, there are some really cool aspects of him, and I found some interesting stories. Like here's one I'll share. There was another famous Scottish uh, anatomist by the name of Robert Knox. He was into something called transcendental anatomy, which I'm not entirely sure what that is, but it seems very much not Darwinian, and even at the time was thought to be like incredibly racist, which is really saying something. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Kind of a questionable guy to begin with, this, this Knox, um, and he was pretty sketchy in how he got his cadavers. So. Uh. He's hey. probably the reason they passed what's called the Anatomy Act of 1832. So I, I, I don't know if uh, Kaveh T have ever told you this, but the mm. name of my band um, is called, my main band that I've been in from, from most of my musical like life, is called the Resurrection Men. And that That's is a cool a, name. It's a, I thought so. It's a cool, yeah. it's, a, it's a name that refers to the grave robbers who would dig up bodies and bring them to the anatomists and surgeons at a time to work uh, on them. Right. I, I only remember this from Gangs of New York, which was like at <laughs> one point something that they were doing to make some extra money. Right, right. That's right. So this this is something that was pretty common. In fact, at one point, body snatching became so prevalent that it was like a relatively well-known thing to do. You like, mm-hmm. someone dies, you have to like take turns sitting with your family or friends to watch over the body to make sure that someone oh, doesn't steal it. get stolen. Yeah. Wow. wow. Pretty pretty crazy. I, and I don't think just for anatomy. I think also for like whatever trinkets they might have been buried right. with. I you think. needed a literal yeah. bodyguard at right. that time. Knox was actually considered to sort of take it to the next level, though. And sure. at one point, he was accused of working with these notorious serial killers, Burke and Hare. With these two guys, Burke and Hare, the most I, I imagine the most stereotypical chimney sweep cockney accent walking around london being like (laughs) hello hello love you know like the really like they were killing people and bringing the bodies and saying hey we found a body here it is it's a good one it's fresh and yeah they were doing that there's so (laughs) i'd love to see the pitch meeting there just be like listen not enough bodies how do we solve this problem it's like one plus two equals money right three the second step is we create more dead bodies that's how you fill the gap (laughs) That's right. Yeah. And that is exactly what happened. And they were bringing bodies to the college. Our boy Liston gets a little suspicious of all this. Mm-hmm. And he's like, some of these bodies you're bringing are awfully healthy looking and like young. So wh- wh- what is going on? So he's getting more and more suspicious of this Knox guy. And there's this story that's, that's famous about him confronting him. One of his like students or someone that's working under uh, Liston comes to him is like, because he knows he wants to know about this. And he's like, hey. They just got this young lady there are they're operating on right now, a body, and she died literally four hours ago. Whoa. And, oh my god. And so Liston's like, that's sketchy as fuck. He runs into like the what I don't know what they called him, the operating room or the autopsy room, I'm not sure what it was called at the time. Comes in, confronts Knox about it, they get into a physical altercation. <sighs> Liston, because he's probably like eight feet taller than this guy, knocks him to the ground. Um, he takes Damn. the body out himself with his assistants and they give her like a proper burial. So Wow. Wow. Pretty kind of some kind of cool shit about this guy, right? Yeah. You could yeah. you could make it you could make a film just about that afternoon. Seriously. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I yeah. there is a, a lot about him that I that I like. And he would he would also like if people were into sketchy stuff without any evidence, he wouldn't hesitate to call them out on it. Like there's another story I saw where he publicly ridiculed this surgeon named James Yearsley, who had just been taking out people's tonsils and uvulas for for stammering. And there's no evidence to that, but he was just like, I think this is what'll help. If I take out your uvula, I think that'll help. No evidence to it, but he would just do it and he was, you know, obviously it's a very painful thing to have happened even today. Yeah. So let let's close with his most famous case. This thing that he's now we're pretty much only known for. Yeah. And it's that surgery. He's moving so fast. He's cutting. He's just whacking away. He's he's trying to get this done as soon as possible. And in the process, his knife comes up and it somehow cuts his assistant's hand. Oh, cuts no. off one of the fingers 
on his assistant's hand. Now, oh God. again, because time is running short, he has to get this leg off and he has to like do this thing quick. He gets back to the patient. He starts cutting at the patient. He gets the leg off. But as the blood is splattering, it splatters on the clothing of some wealthy spectator that was just watching. The wealthy spectator sees blood and guts on him. And the story is he like freaks out, faints, faints. or dies of shock right there. <laughs> oh, he just dies. There's no, he just dies. I, I, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll say my thoughts on that for the very end. But sounds like insurance fraud. The, the patient, yeah. <laughs> yeah the patient yeah. dies of gangrene later because, again, terrible uh, sure. antiseptic treatment here. And the surgeon's assistant, the assistant, he also dies uh, of an infection, gangrene as well. There's a lot to this that is hard for me to swallow. So I, I yeah. try to look, and I see doctors talking about the story. I've seen it mentioned in multiple different like books on medicine at the time, but I cannot find any firsthand account of this happening. First of all, they're all, all dead. Well, <laughs> but there's so many people in that audience, in, the room. Yeah. in that yeah. room. Nobody wrote about it. Nobody. Right. I couldn't find any firsthand account of it being written about. It seems weird because so much of his life other than that yeah. has been written about from firsthand accounts. People writing firsthand accounts of his interaction with Knox, people writing about his his lectures and all the things he's said. It makes no sense to me that we wouldn't have a firsthand account of it. That's the first thing. Two, dying of shock because the blood splatters across yeah. you. I mean, it seems like an exciting, interesting thing to say, and it feels like it could happen. But that seems so unlikely to me. Yeah. If I'm being totally honest, I could see someone fainting. Yeah. I could see someone being grossed out by it. But I don't, I can't believe that person died of shock right there. And that, that just seems so right. unlikely to me. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he's like hitting his head on the way down or something. And then that yeah. causes him to die. But these are facts that I feel would have come out in multiple points if that mm -hmm. were the case. Sure. It, it To me, what it feels like is probably some kernel of truth. Like he cuts his assistant's hand mm -hmm. and someone gets blood splattered on them and they faint. Like some kernel of truth from that grows. And in the setting of this, he's very unliked by his colleagues. And this myth starts to grow and grow. Right. So I can't say for sure if it happened or not. I don't know. But, but is, honestly, I don't feel like it did. Is that is that painting of the, like, is that of the incident? No. Like the, no the, the, okay. That's okay. just like a painting of him, like, teaching, being like, look, and then you cut through this and then. Right. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. There's no there's no painting I saw of the actual incident. There's no firsthand account of it. So who's who's but the I'm guy you said? The the rich guy that died of shock? It's a spectator. Just yeah, a spectator. Also, also, that's true. No name is ever given. Like so I, that I guy, find Yeah. Does that guy maybe have some sort of wealthy if he's wealthy, if he's he's got an heir, right? That's yeah. the conspiracy there, is that this guy's trying to cover up that he wanted this guy to die. He's like, listen, oh. just let the doctor take the the hit for this. I'll get yeah. like whatever a million dollars and I'll split like a couple hundred grand with you. I love the way your brain thinks. It's like an <laughs> 80s movie producer on cocaine. It's fantastic. <laughs> More cocaine. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I don't, a, he uh, would agree with me too, right? The doctor, I'm sure. I mean, More yeah, cocaine for everything. I think back then they used it probably a lot. It's probably one of the good yeah. few good medicines they had. And so again, I, I don't really feel it's true. It seems so unlikely. It seems like one of these mm. stories where it just kind of grows over time and I bet you this story didn't become a real story until many years after his death, mm -hmm. until he right. wasn't able to, to even argue it. And, and I want to keep in, in account here only, which sounds like a lot, but one out of 10 of his patients died on the operating table, which seems like a lot. But you compare that to the other surgeons, like yeah. the other hospitals like uh, St. Bartholomew's nearby, where it was one in four. So yeah. he was clearly ahead of his time. People knew yeah. that too. They were... People were camping out in front of his like office, waiting to be seen by him. Like he was known at the time for being the best in the biz. The best. He's like the well, Otani of surgeries of his day, basically. That's right. Right. Exactly. He had we don't a do Dodgers head. talk here. We don't talk about the Dodgers <laughs> okay. here. I was I was told we would not discuss the Dodgers. <laughs> maybe the Lakers in passing. Maybe. Uh. The, it's maybe it's something like that. Uh, that doctor from Vienna, in that like if the climate is such that somebody that comes up with something that's um that breaks the mold like you know and he ends up in an insane asylum it's like it was just probably like a pretty 
toxic environment. I mean, I've been told that the world of surgery to this day continues to be a bit of a toxic environment. And um, I can only imagine what it must have been back then. So I could see how it could be maybe just uh, a tall tale. Yeah. And you are right. In fact, if you're more interested to learn about modern toxic surgical uh, operating rooms, you can listen to the latest episode of my podcast, The House of Pod, or by the time this is released, a Go couple episodes back. On Spotify and Apple Podcasts now. Yes. Where we do ASMR do the whole time, just like that. <laughs> and I told the story about the, the surgeon in Florida who recently took out someone's liver thinking it was their spleen. Gigash. And and, Gigash, Gigash, and how Gigash. that might have happened. <laughs> and a big part of that, I believe, is because of toxic workplace environment, basically, where people did not feel that they could ask for help and did not mm. feel like they could say something right. about what was happening. So I think I totally agree. I think it's a, it, the operating room in general can be a toxic place. Hospitals, if I'm being honest, can be too. They don't all have to be but some of them can be. And, and I just got the impression that's not really who he was. I mean, I think he was like, I, I don't know. I, I actually, the more I read about this, I the more I started to be like, I kind of like this guy. He's kind of punk rock. Yeah. Like he's yeah. kind of, a, I mean, I, I don't want to paint him as, you know, entirely perfect. I mean, the, there are some cases, well, documented cases, like one, for example, where he's taking off a leg and he cuts off at least one, if not both of this guy's testicles during what? that. Yeah. <laughs> Like How far up is he cutting the leg? Oh, well, right at the right at the right at the joint oh. up there. So way up there. So yeah, yeah, that's documented. And then another one where there was a young, like a, a young kid, who had like a lump in his neck, and he was like, "Ah, oh, that's nothing. It's just an abscess." And he put a knife into it, oh. and it turned out it was an aneurysm, and the kid oh, bled out right shit. there. So he certainly was not perfect. Um, but it's, it's, no, you can't, you, yeah, it's which one of us hasn't accidentally stabbed <laughs> right. a kid in the throat? Yeah. Who hasn't removed testicles? People make mistakes. Yeah. Um, oh my but God. those are also, to my point, those are documented. Those cases, you know what I mean? Right. Right. So, yeah, so like, you think that this that this incident right, would, would be, be better waste. documented yes. as well. So I don't know whether or not it's true or not, but that is a story of Robert Liston, the surgeon who is accused, at least, of having a three hundred percent mortality rate for one surgery, which is really interesting, and he has a very interesting backstory, which I hope. I hope one day I read a book that is really actually well researched and answers these questions because I have not seen it yet. That was fan- you could be the fascinating. One to write it. Yeah, yeah, I you could, could be maybe. the one. It's a lot. It's a lot to put on me, guys. It's a lot to put on me. <laughs> you can do it. You maybe. Gotta be, uh, you got a you got a free afternoon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Give me as long as you're not on call, you can do it. Yeah. Um. Awesome. Well, thank you, Hoda. That, that was, was really wonderful. cool. Yeah. I yeah. Thank you. About all the crazy like inside gossip of surgeries. Oh. So I sent pictures, and you can show them to your to your yes. uh, li- YouTube subscribers. the The picture of the handsome man, uh, the the balding handsome man, that is Liston. The picture I sent of the uh, sketchy guy wearing the strange looking goggles, that is Robert Knox, the sketchy Scottish one with the, the sketchy. I did goggles. not trust that. He's literally holding up a hand, a skeleton hand. Yeah, he see. looks evil the way he's drawn. That's true. His, he's drawn sort of. I don't like. I don't mean to say this disparagingly, but he looks like sloth from uh, from the Goonies. Like his Pose. eyes, like really far. Low. It's just a bad drawing, but yeah, it's he also kind like of an amazing villain. drawing. He, he looks like a villain. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. I loved it. All right, uh, cool. Thank you so much. On to the final tab of the day, which would be mine, of course. So, what do you got? My tab today is about Santa Monica. Ooh, I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. Yeah, I was waiting for one of you guys to start singing Everclear because you're dun, not dun, that generation. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I actually have my guitar. I contemplated whether or not I had time to bust it out, but I was like, I know. Yeah, go grab it. <laughs> yeah. I have mine right here too. Um, no, no, it's actually not about Everclear, unfortunately. But uh, wait, I'm wait, talking wait, about... Do, do you guys all play guitar? Can we Can we start a band? Uh, let's do oh, it. I'm God, not I good, it. but I, I have... So great. I play guitar. Yeah. I'll play that'd drums, be... guitar, whatever you need, man. All right, yeah, well, I can, I can do whatever. Yeah, that would be that again would be awesome. not well, but I can do all of them. I can play bass. Not well, I think Ross Cigar could cover up for yeah, the rest. I think, of yeah, I think that's kind of how we'll make it's it a, work. Not well is a relative six term. more arms. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it'll be great. But anyway, so tabs about Santa Monica, and I don't know about you guys, but these days when I think of Santa Monica, I think of like an insanely expensive real estate, Third Street Promenade being weirdly dead now. 
Uh, and of course, the iconic pier, which is weirdly still kind of okay, because uh, I guess it was never really that nice to begin with. It seemed to have weathered the storm. But You're talking about COVID, kind of killed off the yeah, set. like yeah. a lot of third streets become weirdly like just like a ghost town. Um, oh, but, that's crazy. Uh, anyway, apparently Santa Monica has not always been this weird tourist trap. At one point, it was the Southern California hub for gambling and other illicit activities. Ah. Uh. But wait, was gambling legal in Santa Monica? That's probably what you're thinking, because that's what I was. But guess what? It wasn't. But you know where it was legal? Technically, actually, it wasn't really legal, but there were no laws, was international waters. Uh. <laughs> okay. I, I'm getting Okay. I'm interested. Just, I'm listening. I, I think yeah. I have a sense of where this might be going. It's like a riverboat so, kind of a situation, like the, yeah. the Mississippi. <laughs> That's what I kept thinking too. Is like, listen, yeah. listen, Dad, we're men, all right. <laughs> we do, we like riverboat gambling trips. We shit with the door open. We make our own beef jerky. That's yeah. what we do. Yeah, uh, as step brothers. But anyway, so this <laughs> this venture, this venture was hugely profitable, which of course upset the government so much so that on August first, nineteen thirty nine, Attorney General. Earl Warren sent 250 local and state officers to raid four gambling ships anchored off the coast of Santa Monica and Long Beach. Wow. The first two were raided without issue. But upon approaching the SS Rex, officers officers were met with armed gunmen and high-pressured fire hoses, resulting in a nine-day standoff. Wow. That's rad. So this is the story of how the Battle of Santa Monica Bay unfolded. Oh, my God. Great. The Battle of Santa Monica, that is a good album title. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, Rage Against the Machine. Rage that Against it? the Machine, yeah. yeah Zach yeah. De La Rocha singing a song yeah. about this. Um, so first off, how do we get here? Long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, a man named L.B. Tudor Shearer first had an idea of gambling ships. Sounds and... like the name of a guy that would do that. Like, oh, he's destined for greatness with a name like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tudor was an early investor in a lot of Las Vegas real estate and hotels, casinos, et cetera, including the Sahara Hotel, which I'm sure you guys have both heard of. It's kind of this iconic spot. Tudor was doing very well for himself in Vegas back in those days. So, of course, he has this idea like we got to go even bigger because that's what every man does as soon as they make a little bit of money. They get more and more ambitious. And he comes up with this insane idea of floating casinos. And he says, okay. Uh, If you just station them three miles off the coastline, you're no longer under the jurisdiction of the state of California. But because this is back in the 1920s, the laws were different. Luckily, also, if you do three miles off the coast of California, it's just close enough where you can get people to hop on like a water taxi and they can get out there in about like 10, 15 minutes. It's relatively close. Is this, I'm sorry, is this kind of high, are you getting the sense that this is like high end? like Santa Monica style, like people like gambling, or is this just like all comers, like going to these, these boats? The answer is yes. <laughs> right. And this would be you get like everybody. the, but this would be the height of the depression, right? Like the, the, the face off happened this is uh, right before it. This causes oh, the depression. When did it happen? It happened in so 20? 19, 1927. 27. Okay. Tudor opens up a nondescript barge where people right. could fish over the boat's railing as well as play poker inside. Ah, but um, then the but then the um the the face off the battle of Santa Monica happens when it happens a few years later. So he's actually not the person in charge of it. He's just the guy that goes out to California and he has this idea cuz he comes from Vegas and he says, "I'm going to make this right. barge. Yeah. If we're just 3 miles out, we can set up this taxi system." Yeah. And he does it. We're going to make bank. And yeah. We're going to make bank. So he sort of yeah. he presents this proof of concept and of course, it becomes very popular. Unfortunately, I have to make this joke. It seemed his gamble had paid off. Boo. Yes. His. Very good. Very no, good. I'm proud yeah, of you. you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just enjoy that one for a second. Yeah. <laughs> thanks Thanks for the warning. And it's sufficiently perfect. That's yeah, great. <laughs> so like any business, as soon as anyone saw that this shit's making money, all of a sudden, everybody wants in on it. Mm-hmm. And suddenly, there's these other competing gambling ships that pop up. It's mm-hmm. like hot dog vendors outside the Hollywood Bowl or something. There's just like a string of them in a row. Yeah. They're everywhere. Probably marketing course, to different like sort of people. That's great. Yeah. I'm fascinated. Yeah. And of course, as soon as you say 
gambling and outside gov- government jurisdiction three times, the mob is going to appear like Beetlejuice because these guys just, that's that's their jam. They love that shit. Next thing you know, you get a guy, his name is Tony Cornero. He's Ooh. suddenly in on the game. Have you guys heard of him before? Sounds like a villain from a Batman comic. Yeah, no, I, that's true. absolutely sounds like mafia. Married to a Persian lady. You know, yeah. that's what's going to happen in the film yeah. adaptation Classic. of this eventually. Who smokes too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tony, we need to get in on this gambling <laughs> ship game. <laughs> Pretty good Persian impression. Yeah. So Tony, Tony had already been a successful bootlegger. So at this time in the twenties, prohibition is you know fully happening. And uh, what he did, which is interesting, is he used a shrimping business as a cover to smuggle Canadian whiskey into Southern California uh, with a small fleet of freighters. And he was also a rum runner. And one time, authorities caught him returning from Mexico with a thousand cases of rum. He joked that he'd purchased the illegal cargo, quote, to keep 120 million people from being poisoned to death. (laughs) That's great. I'm doing this for the public. I'm I'm the hero here. I'm the hero here. He's a fun guy. He's really funny. He's like filled with all these like little quips and like goofy things that he does. So he's kind of he's great. And he always wears this like Stetson. He's always got like this white hat on. I think like one of his nicknames is like the hat. You call him oh. like Tony the Hat Cornero. He had a oh. couple of different ones. Boy, they but... just gave up. They gave up at that <laughs> point. They were not there was no effort going into those nicknames at that point. <laughs> They're just like, hey, it's the hat. Look at him. Hey, it's Tony the guy. The guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's fun and his heart belongs to the sea already. He loves he loves running ships and stuff. So he's like, after being arrested a bunch of times, and then he goes, he goes on the lam in Europe and he does this short stint in Vegas. Eventually he comes back and he's ready for his next move. And in 1936, so this is about you know, six, seven years later. He hears about the what they're calling now is are the sin ships. That's the term that the press is using to describe these gambling ships. And so to him, it was like hearing the Beatles for the first time. He's like, oh, my God, I'm in love. This is the most amazing <laughs> thing I've ever heard. It's beautiful. So Tony scraps together some cash and he gets a couple boats and he converts them into luxury casinos, which he names the Rex and the Tango. These are his first two ships that he gets. His main ship was the Rex. And so kind of to your point, you're asking if it's like this big thing that's super fancy or is it like a kind of working class thing? He's the guy who comes and makes the first big, like, I don't know, I don't go to Vegas ever. So whatever, Luxor, I don't know what like the big fancy casino is, like the Caesar, whatever like the big fancy one is. He's like, he brings like that sort of Vegas flair to this gambling ship thing because he's also got Vegas money. This guy's made a bunch of cash off of all this prohibition stuff. The Rex could accommodate over 2000 gamblers. And it carries this crew of 350 people, including waiters, waitresses, gourmet chefs, a full orchestra, and of course, a squad of hired goons. Because, you know, he's he's a mob guy. Of course, you got to have that. You have to have goons. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I had goons. Me too. It would be so great. Size 15 shoes, all of them. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Whole crew of Rastagars doing my bidding. I'd be unstoppable. (laughs) that's what you should call your fan base i think i would love that i would would gladly wear a t-shirt that says rastagoon yeah proud rastagoon so tony offers his customers roulette pharaoh blackjack stud poker high spade craps chuckaluck chinese lottery he installed 150 slot machines a horse parlor and a bingo room for up to 400 people this guy goes all out a horse parlor yeah, like where you can bet on horse races. Okay, but they're not like racing the horses on the boat. I mean, I, that it, would be it's amazing. possible. <laughs> that would be inc- I would so go on a gambling boat if they were racing horses. They're just <laughs> I could, three can you trots. The smell, though, I bet, oh. I bet it gets, they're rough. You could have it outside, you yeah, know, if it's point. like on the that's deck where yeah, yeah. it's not like an enclosed space. Yeah. Um, but that's 10 points. I love, your, I love where your head's at. Yeah. And like I said, Tony is this very charismatic, outspoken, funny guy. He loved hobnobbing and he loved being seen and making a splash. It wasn't enough that this new ship came out and it was crazy. He also, you know, he's perfect for Los Angeles. So when the Rex opened on May 5th, 1938, Tony promoted it with a skywriting campaign. Like he had, you know, when the planes go up and they're like, go to the Rex casino outside of outside of Santa Monica. And he also took out full page ads in the L.A. Times, assuring the viewer that the Rex was, quote, run honestly. Nice. And I can show you some pictures of the ads if you guys are interested. I think they're yeah, really funny. Yeah, if you, at the time, 
were people not worried? I mean, they were just like openly advertising it. I feel like it's still the kind of thing they would want to have done a little hush hush. Like, so they did it attract like the attention of law enforcement stuff, but it sounds like this was just openly being done. It's openly being done. It was like an open secret in Los Angeles. But mm-hmm. to your point, a lot of people didn't like it. Uh, but of but course, also, as with the yeah, go ahead. The 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 LAPD was 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 pretty corrupt back then too, right? Mm. Back then, back then, yeah, back yeah back exactly. Then. Not, they're not anymore. No, yeah, totally. We fixed it, guys. It's been solved. <laughs> As soon as we got rid of the riverboat gambling, (laughs) everything went back to normal and it's perfectly fine. Never had a problem with the LA cops again. Yeah. Clean clean house. Yeah. Um, Yes, of course. Of course. Always corruption. Always corruption. If you make enough money and you pay off enough people, you can keep your business afloat. Again, sorry. Pun intended. Nice. Um, And again, of course, don't forget, it's the laws are different. It's only three miles out. Three miles is not far. And uh, much like his sin ship predecessors, his clientele would arrive by a 10-minute 10, 10 water taxi ride from the Santa Monica Fear for 25 cents round trip. Can't beat that. That's a solid deal. Yeah, right. Yeah. And the Rex becomes hugely popular. It earns about $200,000 a month, which is almost, oh, it's like close to $4 million today. And kind of to your point, Rastegar, it's it's this hub of corruption. Cash is funneled to police, prosecutors, judges, elected officials, everybody. Los Angeles's reputation starts to get a bit uncouth and a lot of people outside of LA are they're like, hmm, Sin City, huh? It used to be Vegas, but it's actually Santa Monica Pier. Right. And this upset who? Elliot Ness. Elliot Ness. J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover. <laughs> no? State Attorney General Earl oh. Warren. Earl That's, Warren. That was okay. my next guess. That was okay. the next guess, yeah. Now, Earl Warren, this guy, he's a real missionary sex kind of guy he doesn't like skim milk and salt's like too spicy he's just like buy the book first and... of all don't don't discredit missionary sex there's nothing wrong <laughs> no with missionary only sex. it's like that's all he does yeah that's it. I there's mean, nothing any, else on the menu. any position if it's your only position you're doing it wrong but come on i'm tired i you know what missionary sex is the the creed <laughs> of of sex it's like maybe not as bad as you think it is okay give it a second listen is what i'm trying to say and the mission and the missionaries give it a bad name that's it's true the yeah. problem yeah, yeah. The missionaries <laughs> the title was different it would be yeah, a little bit more acceptable exactly. this is the point of the story right yes yeah I okay. so. actually i wanted to talk about earl warren's sex life <laughs> and i was <laughs> like such a great transition <laughs> ah. yeah it's all been a red herring to... yeah <laughs> The MacGuffin. Tantric sex with Earl Warren. This is what Sting studied to become the champion that he became. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So naturally, all this flagrant corruption makes this guy's blood boil. He hates it. And Tony, he's been arrested. Kind of, Again, you're, you guys are kind of mentioning this earlier. He's arrested a bunch of times. But he always gets out on like, you know, bail or bond or whatever. And the legal case is always like, well, it's international waters. Like, he, it's it's murky. Again, another pun. Yeah, uh, nice. you can't really. It's it's tough to nail him down. Yeah, and that's what the mob's great at. That's what these guys are. You know, these guys are basically always lawyers. Like partially, they just know the law so well, and they know that like, okay, if I do this, that, and the other thing, it's not really going to uphold this case. But Warren, Warren's a smart guy, and he makes the legal case. What do you think the legal case is that makes him mm-hmm. that begins the process? Uh they because they have to. Comm- they start off at the pier. Um, and that's part of the process. They pay at the pier, and that is sort of included in it. And or Last the cigar, boat is docked there. God, what would be what would be the loophole? It would be um, it would be some sort of license. They they needed some sort of license to oh right like um, the food license or something. It's like yeah. something not related to the gambling or the yeah. drinking, something like that. Yeah, it's even weirder. He makes the legal case that Santa Monica is a bay. Therefore, it is under the jurisdiction of California. Ah, okay. So if you look, so for those of you who are listening, if you look at Santa Monica, it basically like imagine, you know, like a slab of coastline and then there's a bite taken out of it. You know, that's your classic bay shape. And that's where Santa Monica lies. Now, the way that the jurisdiction used to work was if you sort of draw an outline outside of the coastline, um, the three mile line would follow all the way in. So it would go on the side and then it would go into the little bay inlet area and then go around it. So they're just not far enough out into these international waters for his liking. 
or for, for his. his liking, he says. Yeah. So what he says is, if you take, he's like, okay, technically though, it's not the Pacific Ocean. Santa Monica is a bay. So he draws this line from Point Doom in Malibu yeah. to Point Vicente in Palos Verdes, which essentially closes the uh, the bite that's taken mm. out of the coastline. It's like Malibu says, to Long Beach is the coast. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's what he's saying. He's like, we got to. He's like, because it's got like you know, uh, land on three sides of it, and he makes this whole like weird case of like there's this part that I tried reading about that was confusing, but it's about like being protected from wind is somehow some legal oh. case. So it was both the legality of like what the jurisdiction of California is, what constituted as a bay. And it was like all these weird, like nautical things. Mm. He goes and says, this is a bay that's under the jurisdiction of California. So technically if we just filled it in and just made it all part of it, the three mile line needs to start outside of that, which is closer right. to like, 15 miles away from the shore of where Santa Monica is, where all these people were jumping onto those uh, water taxis. Right. Seems it would it, make it impossible to to have this business. Yeah. That's an interesting argument. I mean, I'm looking at a map right now. I'm not as familiar, obviously, with the region oh, yeah, as you I have, guys I've are. I've got images. Sorry. Let me, let me well, throw so, it up. I, I mean, I'm looking at a map right now. And yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I could see the argument that's a bay, but you could also extend that argument to be like, well, you have to start from Santa Barbara. And if you're not further out than Santa Barbara, then you're in you're in the bay or what, something like that. You know, I feel like there is it seems like a very slippery slope. I'm kind of surprised that worked enough for them to get a, uh, uh, I guess, a warrant. Is that how it is? Like they were actually able to make a strong legal case because of this. Um, so in November 1939, the Supreme Court of California unanimously agreed with Warren and reversed the court of appeal. So essentially wow. they said that's now part of California. That's now uh, no longer international waters, even if it's three miles out from the coast of where Santa Monica Bay is. So mm. they essentially like reconstituted uh, it. They reclassified it. So, so if you look at the two so, images I sent. Yeah, so, go ahead. But that brings me back to the original thing that was kind of that's fascinating about this. Like ni November 1939, that's like, you know, that's uh, what, 12 years after that one guy gets into the business. It's like. This has been a decade that they have Boast. these river these these boats not river boats but these uh, casinos out on these ships. That's crazy. Yeah. And, and then and, and then all through and all through the depression, right? It's like you yep. know, like wow. I mean, people are people are on a hard time, or like you know, you can just imagine like the you know the people escaping the Dust Bowl coming to the Promised Land of California and then getting to this mm -hmm. landscape of like the Hoovervilles and then the then the these uh, the Rex Casino off of the coast of yeah. Santa Monica. Yeah, and he, and he talked about it too. There's like some interview where they said that he's like, that's his bread and butter. His bread and butter was not, even though he would get like, you know, these famous celebrities, it's LA, right? You always got some like starlet or like some Hollywood, some fancy producer. Like it's cause it's a casino. You're always going to get something like that. But he's like, my bread and butter were like the regular people who would just come and dump their money in and then lose a bunch and then leave. Do, do you know about a film that's like depicted? Because you know, you, I was wondering you got, the same thing. How would Hollywood yeah, like, has this not been made into a movie? Yeah, like L.A. Confidential is a good, you know, like that that kind of early Hollywood era, like film noir kind of a of, of a thing. I, I've never seen it. De I've never seen these depicted in any of these films. I have. I didn't think to actually look it up to see if it was a movie. It's possible, but I, not the one that I'm familiar with. Although. I do tend to every, it seems like every single tab I do for this show tends to be like, I think this would be a cool movie. And I end up structuring the tabs as such. So that's a compliment. Thank you guys both. Uh, <laughs> I'm looking it up while you keep going. See if yeah. there's a movie made. Let's find, it. Let's find out. So it, like I said, in 1930, in November, 1939, the Supreme court unanimously passed uh, Warren's request essentially. And they're like, yeah, you're right. Okay. This is a bay. These are no longer international waters. And the international waters line gets pushed back 15 miles from the coast with the, uh, the technicality. But before that, Warren knew because he was he's again, he's like a really to the T kind of like smart guy. And he knows that they're going to pass this. He's like, this is legally clad. There's no way they're not going to like be on board with this. But he didn't want to waste any time waiting for all that to get sorted. So a couple months before, on July 28th, 1939, he issued a, a notice of abatement that charged these gambling ships, quote, contributed to the delinquency of minors by openly glorifying gambling and the evasions of the laws of the state by inducing them to lead idle and dissolute lives. Yeah. <laughs> like a like a record label or like a record sticker. Right. Yeah. That's, Parental advisory explicit parental, lyrics is the, all over it's the, this. The PMRC, yeah. So by this point, officers went and they served each of the ship operators the five-page notice. 
Uh, and remember, so the fr- I, I mentioned the first two was the Rex and the other one, but he's got a couple more ships at this point. But and there's other people doing it, right? This is like other people's boats out there, or is he the only game in town at this point? You know, that's I, I think at this point he sort of took it over. I could be wrong. I I, I didn't think the the story tend to focus on him. On him. Yeah. Uh, and I know that other people were doing it. I don't know if other people stopped doing it or right. they were maybe it was just uh, they were three point five miles out or something. Right, right. I, I bet you there were other people, but it might just be that he's the big, he's making the biggest splash. Right. Uh, so yeah, nice. the he's biggest the one fish. that keeps getting arrested. He's the biggest fish. Yeah. Nice. So yeah. it's it's important for Earl Warren particularly to be like, this is the person that you need to make an example of um, because he's the most right. flagrant uh, violator. Um, no so, film, by the way. I can't find any film, just so you know. Listen, it, this could be the beginning. There you go. We could produce it, the three of us together. Yeah. We got... We could we could Tons do surgeries time. on those boats. We got to... <laughs> yeah. I'll give the boats a colonoscopy. Very yeah. important for filmmaking. You, you can write if the, the score. Need a bass it'll be perfect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could make a cameo in it for sure. At least both of you guys. You'd be and there is an orchestra on the boat on the Rex. Oh, exactly. that's so much fun. Anyway, so uh, they hand out this five page notice. All the ships ignored the notices and they continued gambling operations. They're like, yeah, we don't care. We're gonna wipe our asses with this. And two days later, on August first. Warren orders raids and he watches from a Santa Monica beach club through binoculars. He doesn't even go do it himself. Now, by this point, Tony's operation had a couple of other ships, like I said, and they fell pretty much without issue to any of Warren's Warren's officers. They came in, they served them the whatever, and they're like, okay, cool. But when it came to the Rex, which is his flagship ship, Tony was like, "Uh uh-uh, nope, this is my baby. You'll pry it from my cold, dead hands. And so begins a standoff. Even though they've got all those Rasta goons on board with like Tommy guns and all that shit, he's like, I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to shoot at a bunch of federal off or not federal, but a bunch of California officers. And so he takes like nets and starts tossing nets at all these officers that are coming. And then he's also got a bunch of fire hoses. Yeah. Great alternative. Yeah. That's where the cops learn to use those. That's fantastic. Yeah, I was going to say. He's the guy that taught them. I, I'm curious. You may you may not know this. It may not be available. But yeah. were people like gambling during this whole thing? Yep. Oh yep. wow, that's hard. They were throwing. They were throwing like poker chips at the at the, the yeah. police as well. <laughs> the cops. Yeah. <laughs> the kid. They're like, don't stop. Keep going. Don't worry about the police. Keep gambling. Keep gambling. Everything's fine. Nothing to see here, folks. Yeah. D- don't stop the horse races on the on the ships. I, I'm sure going. they actually charged people to spray the hose at them. That's like the savvy <laughs> businessman, you know? Um, That's This is crazy. Yeah, I never knew about this. And the cops are like, waterboarding? What? That's our move. What are you guys doing? You can't do that. <laughs> yeah, Right. And so it yeah. becomes a standoff. And Tony's like, bring it, bro, whatever. I got 200 members, <laughs> crew members on my payroll and plenty of food aboard for my 600 guests. I don't really care. I could, wow. I'll stay here all day. It doesn't matter to me. But and, then some of those um, guests had places to go. So, So how did that work out? Exactly. They were, they were, quote, temporary prisoners caught in the crossfire of the two sides of the law. On the first night, so the first night he does it, he's like, we're not moving. We're not going to go. He, it gets cold and the cops are all kind of chilling on these boats around them. And Tony, like I said, he's like this cheeky bastard. And so he goes and he gets a bunch of whiskey and he tosses it down to the officers who have been posted up outside. And he's just like, hey, here you go. That'll put some hair on your chest. Just remember, Tony Cornero took care of you out on the SS Rex when you were freezing cold. And eventually, the Coast Guard commander helped broker a deal between Tony and Warren so that the guests, the gamblers, could be removed. They didn't want anyone freaking out and doing some crazy shit and trying to escape and getting killed. And Tony, being a smart guy, he knows how to work the law. He's like, okay. You're right. I don't want to add insult to injury and make this any worse than it needs to. He knew sort of what the legal case was that he could stay on. You're not allowed to kidnap people even in international waters and hold them hostage. So by the morning, these you know the taxis come and they take everybody out and it's fine. So it's just Tony that's left with all of his dudes and crew members and whatever. They start to wait it out for a few more days. And this is disputed. <laughs> But again, colorful character. At one point, Tony was said to have hauled down the Rex's U.S. flag and threatened to raise that of the Empire of Japan. <laughs> Which, what? yeah, yeah, like What's... a few years later, would yeah attack attack Pearl Harbor. Yeah, exactly. What yeah. what was his um, 
reasoning? Why did he pick the Japanese flag there for that? I what for that? I think he's just trolling. I think he's just every move of his is just to be like, how do I look? How do I look more insane? How do I draw more attention to myself? And how do I embarrass the uh, government of California? Gotcha. And like, you know the the officers even more. He, he's pulling the. I thought this was America. I thought yeah. we were in a free country. Sort of freedom thing. of speech. Freedom right. of gotcha. like gambling. You know, it's not that dissimilar to all these. You know. Rich people now, these assholes who just like want to take as much oxygen as they can online by just being a troll in any way possible. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you sort of win the PR war, like the media war. They realize he realized yeah. at that time that like if you can control that, you can sort of control people's narratives about. I'm who a you sovereign are. nation. Basically, the standoff continues for a total of ten days, back and forth. They spray him with water. They try and throw the nets. It's just like back and forth. No one knows what to do. Warren's getting more angry, but he's not backing down. Tony realized eventually that he met someone who was more stubborn and more of a bastard than he was. And eventually he relented to pressure. But Tony being Tony, he didn't just come out and surrender. When asked why he finally decided to come out from his fortress, he said, quote, and this is real, I have to get a haircut. And the only thing I don't have on board is a barber. Wow. This guy probably ran for office at some point and won. <laughs> That's the fucked up thing about this country. Is yeah, he's absolutely like a kind, of like, kind of a Trumpy, kind of a Trumpy guy. Real Trumpy vibe on this guy. Yeah, yeah. And that was that. And there was a bunch more legal battles, but eventually, it's it was done. The gambling ships are gone. I think at one point they sort of made the the fair the taxis illegal through some other weird jurisdictiony something or other. Warren wins. And Tony well, he doesn't leaves go town. To jail. Tony doesn't go to jail. Uh, he does. He not permanently. He it's again. He keeps getting taken to jail and then gets taken out because he just pays his bond or whatever. But eventually he does lose because gambling ships are no longer legal. And uh, as far as the uh, case to continue it as a business, even if like you know because they re redrew the line and the line goes whatever like twelve miles in. So then now it's going to be fifteen miles from Santa Monica Bay. Uh, kind of what you were saying earlier. Like that's. That's no longer a quick 25 cent round trip thing that's done in 10 minutes. Yeah. It takes like three times as long for them to do that. So it doesn't become this economically viable uh, option anymore, even though he's making like so many millions of dollars. But I think for the people who are gambling, who aren't necessarily trying to spend like half the day going out to the water and half the day coming back, uh, it, it just adds a couple bit more barriers between them and getting there. Kind of like, you know, if, you're, if your gym's really far away, you're not going to go to the gym like more than once a month but if yeah. it's like right My across the street is, you're gonna go mm, i yeah. need it closer so the trick with gambling is make sure that it's accessible if you want to go if you're gonna go to a casino and have a gambling problem yeah. don't put too many steps between you and gambling make sure it's right, as right. easy as possible to get there which i remember yeah. I, I remember being on tour and i mean that's that's kind of just like that's the workaround for casinos right like all the like it, it all involves a, like some sort of le legal loophole, and that's mm -hmm. that's. I mean, I remember going to a like there was a riverboat. I don't know if there still is in in, in um, St. Louis where you you can just gamble till the middle of the night or you know all hours of the day, and uh, you know, but it's not legal. It's it's legal on the Mississippi River on mm -hmm. you know so floating around and moving. Wow, yeah, that's wild. That exactly. is wild. Yeah. I have to say, it's like a really interesting. So, what, so what, what ends up happening to this guy long term? Like, this right. he end up long term? Like... Yeah, Tony leaves town, and in 1944, he opened a casino in Las Vegas, uh, and then two years later, he tries to do another gambling ship, but that was legally thwarted again. It doesn't really work out for him, and I think like at some point, in, like the 50s, he dies. There's like some assassination attempt on him, but basically, Ooh. his gambling days, his uh, his riverboat gambling days are over. And, um, Too bad. I would have liked to have seen him do it on a plane. Be like, wait, wow, yeah. we're gonna do it on a plane. <laughs> plane it's gambling. Be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Earl exactly. Warren, as you may or may not already know, went on to become Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court in 1953. Yeah, I knew that. And then yeah. uh, that's the Warren Commission that looks uh, investigates the Kennedy uh, assassination. Holy shit! That is that it? Is? I yeah. was is kidding. I have no, that, I have I no like, idea. Like, I don't know if the Warren Commission was his. Is it? I totally. Yeah, let's, let's find ass. out. I'm just yeah again no, talking. We're not ending this until we know these details here. We need to know. Yeah, who would play yeah, him? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. You're right. The commission took its unofficial name from its chairman, the Chief Justice Earl Warren. Yep. That was uh, that was a that was a that was a good tab. Yeah. KT. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. I appreciate it. Glad you guys enjoyed it. That's all for me. That's my tab. And now 
we're at the part of the show where we're going to close our tabs together. Okay, great. Um, do you guys have any thoughts about what you would like to play as far as the sound effect from when we close them? Can we hear like a really farty bass sound? Like a mouth. <laughs> <"Bow." laughs> <"Bow." laughs> well, the Seinfeld bass. The Seinfeld thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we, we do have a drum roll, so we, we can incorporate that into it, which drummers are already a part of it. Mm-hmm. I great. guess we can have surgery sounds. Like how about a chainsaw cutting off a leg? Yeah, yeah, screaming. You want to do some? Yeah. Yeah. I like all that. I'm into that. Yeah. Let's do all it. Right. Yeah. Let's do it. You guys ready? I'm going to count it. us. Or uh, who wants to count us down? So wait, what am I doing? I'm I'm just logging off. Is that what I'm doing? No, just closing no, no, no. your tab. <laughs> just closing, closing tab. the, uh, did you open up a bunch of tabs for the, for the article of all the stuff that you were going to present or did you? I did. Them? I did. So okay. I, yeah. So okay. Keep, keep this window open. Cause we got to record uh, a little bit more, but just okay. to close the tabs that you had opened for this podcast. Okay, great. Uh, for the research. You ready? Yeah. Hoda, you want to count us down? Sure. In three, two, one. Spadoo. <laughs> Okay, moving on to listener emails. I got a fun surprise for you guys. Our first and only email is from a young man. Can you guess what his name is? If it's not Kave, it's Sarah. It's Kave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Hello, I'm Kava of the G variety. As I pour genuine Federation produced maple syrup on cheese curds here in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. If you guys oh, don't know, I, I just didn't did know we had them there. <laughs> we are branching out. We are. Uh, if you guys don't know, I did a. That's a reference because uh, a couple of weeks ago I did an episode about the maple syrup heist. Oof. Um About maple syrup. Canada. Yeah, it's a great uh-huh. one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I'd like to tell you about a material I came across on the chemistry blog called "In the Pipeline" by Derek Lowe. A very hmm interesting material that Lowe has vowed never to work with in his lab, and it left my jaw hanging open. <laughs> it's called chlorine trifluoride, and it's hyper. Gallic, hyperjolic, probably gallic with the hard G, so uh, and it gets worse. Hypergolic means that it'll spontaneously combust upon contact with an appropriate fu- fuel with no spark or heat needed to get it going. You might think that this already makes the stuff evil, but not so fast. For example, the Germans were interested in using it in self-igniting flamethrowers in the 1940s. For what purpose, I wonder, has anyone looked into that? Uh, but they found it too nasty to work with, got burnt, and gave up. So I don't think it's pure evil per se. It was just born this way. This way being that it really, really wants to have a chemical reaction with something and it doesn't much care what. It's the most potent fluorinating agent known and a more potent oxidizing agent than pure oxygen. The last sentence will make most people who know some chemistry to say nope and start turning away if they haven't already because it means chlorine trifluoride can go on to burn things that have already been completely burnt and exhausted by oxygen. Things such as ash or carbon dioxide or bricks or glass or sand are fuel to be burned. That's terrifying. Jesus. I'm going to tell you right Uh, now, this cafe needs to be put on a watch list. Uh, (laughs) Because they're talking about like some propellant shit that's starting to make me nervous as a cafe. Like, doesn't this cafe realize we're not allowed to talk about this sort of stuff? (laughs) Exactly. He's, 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 He's what puts us all on the TSA list. God, funny, bless it. funny you guys should say that. I'll keep reading. It's also extremely toxic and corrosive, so there are the byproducts of its reactions. There was a one ton spill of the stuff in the 50s when they were experimenting with it as a rocket propellant. One witness reported, quote, the concrete, the concrete floor was on fire. It went on to burn through 30 centimeters of concrete, 90 centimeters of gravel under the floor, spewing hot vapor clouds containing copious amounts of chlorine gas, fluorine gas, hydrochloric acid, hydrochlor- hydrofluoric acid, dichloromethane, and other wonderful byproducts in the process. So I hope everyone's having a good day. And if not, at least you didn't have to handle chlorine trifluoride at work today. If you did, email me. I want to be friends. Also, I'm realizing I'm totally going to be taken to the room by TSA next time I fly as if being one of the Kavas wasn't enough for that. It's funny you guys got there. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, he, he kind of threw us all under the bus with that one. Made his own bed on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, if I may opine, let us continue to keep it Josie rather than meeting at the shitting wall that has, uh, that has been suggested. (laughs) It's maladress there. Cheers. Keep it Josie. Kava G. Kava G. We salute you. You Another from the Council of Kaves, we salute you. We, we salute you. <laughs> what does he salute. say in Star Wars? He's like, we grant you the Jedi Council 
but does not give you the count the uh the term of jedi the label of jedi i'm slaughtering my uh, yeah episode so three. you you upset star trek and star wars fans yeah that was uh, star trek that's and pretty star impressive yeah. yeah exactly anyway you guys know you fill it in so if you yeah. are listening and you have a listener email that you'd like to submit please send it to 500 open tabs at gmail.com that's five zero zero uh we also accept uh voice memos keep them short probably around a minute so just let us know a fun thing that you've learned uh the link to the tab and of course where you're from and that about brings us to the end of the show uh my kava friends here i want to thank you again for doing this book report for us doing a wonderful job it's been a fantastic time talking to you both and getting to actually get this together because we've been talking about it for so long yeah Uh, but on behalf of me and hannah and Alyssa and all of our listeners thank you guys i i have to say i've been Looking forward to this for a long time. I do a lot yeah, of podcasting. I go on a lot of podcasts. I host my own podcast. But I am seldom as excited as I've been to like be on with you guys. I really feel like even though I've never met you in person and barely hung out, really, I feel like I know you guys. I really yeah. do. And, and <laughs> yeah. it's so much fun. It feels like a little part of myself has grown because of this i love it so it's been super fun uh to, to hang out i've really enjoyed this I, I would like to do it again sometime yeah I, I agree it was this is again like one of the the funnest most unexpected things that could you know and it should have happened from twitter i'm really right. I'm, I'm really really yeah. glad to know you guys and this yeah this is awesome it's really cool yeah i'm Wonderful. down anytime um and uh yeah thanks so much for having me yeah, thank you. Uh, so, Rastagard, you want to go ahead and uh, tell people where they can find you? Or are you doing any shows, any you know, social media, whatever you want to plug before we wrap oh, this up? Oh gosh, um, I I just I make a lot of music. I help a lot of people make music. So it's it's you can find it all on. I mean, I guess I keep my Instagram page pretty updated. So it's my first and last name, and then that's where you can kind of find links to everything I'm working on. And uh, yeah, thanks for that. Wonderful. Hoda, what about you? You can find me at a lot of different social media things at the House of Pod. That's the name of my podcast, the House of Pod, P-O-D. It's sort of a humor adjacent look at medicine and public health. And I'll have people come on who are experts in medicine and pair them with uh, somebody who is in a different field, like a musician or a comedian. And we'll talk about things and make medicine, I think, a little bit more accessible, a little bit less scary, uh, and it's informal and fun. So I think you'll like it. So check it out, and you'll hear an episode uh, with a uh, Cave host of this show. Uh, not too fun. not too long ago, you'll hear him again, and obviously we're going to get Rastagar also on the show. So <laughs> it, it, you, you will get your Cave fix there yeah. at the House of Pod. <laughs> This is uh, just the beginning. This is just the beginning of a, yeah, a yeah, Kaveh exactly. extended universe. Um, so, yeah. thanks. Hey, thanks again for having us. This was super fun. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And once again, as you guys all know, we are at 500 Open Tabs on Instagram. Join the Discord. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow the sponsor links. I'm at Permafriends. And uh, keep a lookout for Hannah's uh, book tour. If she's going to come to a city near you, make sure you go say hello. Uh, once again, Thank you both to the Council of Kava's fantastic time. And uh, until the next episode, I like to sign off by saying Secundus next and shed here five times. But what was your, <laughs> what was the doctor's catchphrase again that he said at the end of every surgery? Time me, what was it? Time me. Uh, time me, fellas, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> time me, bros, I think is what he said. <laughs> time sure. me, bros. That's how we're going to end yeah. this one. <laughs>